My name is Gloria Johnson. I'm, I'm a victim of uh, court corruption and legal abuse. Um, I was a victim of sexual assault and um, physical abuse and emotional abuse. And um, my ex-husband is a registered nurse. He has a license to practice medical. And he, at the time, he was working at the ACI in Cranston, Rhode Island. He was stealing medication and self-medicating from the, uh, um, the ACI. He became very distraught and paranoid and his behavior was very ill, sick. Um, he was abused by his grandfather. He had to give him oral sex from the age of 6 to 13. I found out in his medical records. He had to be taken out of work at the time, I think it was like 2005 or 2006, by the EAP Employment Assistant Program and go to a psychiatrist for his delusions. I obtained his psychological records and it stated in there that he was having horrific flashbacks almost 24 to 30 a day about his grandfather sexually molesting him and um, he could not handle work. He um, also in that report stated that he had still had thoughts about sexually acting out. I tried to get him help and give him help and he just became very, very sick and I had to get him out of the house. Um, in 2000, latter part of 2005, I called 911 because he got into the house and he threatened to kill me and take the kids. Um, I got out of the house and called 911. The kids were upstairs um, and that's when we started the... My daughter, before she got in the shower and said, could, she, could, uh, could they tell whose fingers had been down there? And that was a big red flag. So. Um, the, we went to court, I hired a lawyer, I gave him $40,000 retainer. I had a personal injury lawsuit, my a back injury from a car accident where I lost a baby. I was pregnant and um, I used all of that, which was $175,000. Um, and the ball started rolling. Um, once I disclosed sexual abuse, it just seemed so unreal. Um, the kids were court ordered into reunification therapy with their sex offender, their father. And um, after he had highly supervised visits with Chrissy that he couldn't handle, he said in front of the supervisor that he wanted to commit suicide because he was so distraught. He pulled the car over and told my daughter that in front of the supervisor. He was shopping in Walmart with Chrissy and the supervisor was supposed to be there and um, he took off in the super Walmart and the supervisor couldn't find Chrissy and my ex-husband um, and she ran out to the car to see if he had kidnapped her and um, came back in the store and overhead paged and Chrissy was still there. At this point Chrissy was losing her hair, having horrific nightmares um, about him coming to kill us. We had all the doors, we were just hostages in our own house, in our own town. Um, and um, they finally, after the super highly supervised visits on, on the outside in the community, and he did this, then he was put into highly supervised visits in a therapist, a, an evaluator that was ordered by the court um, for re reunification therapy. Um, my kids begged me to go to jail and please don't do this to them, and they were standing in back of me. And Peter Kossoff, this is the court evaluator for Washington County Family Court, told me if I don't get those kids in there that he knew Judge Dammer very well and I would be in big trouble. And I said, please go over the medical records first. And, he, and um, at that time I had medical records from upstate New York where he had sodomized me. I had the police report. I said, please, Peter, just please read these. And he threw them back at me and he said, I have enough records. He never once talked to the kids' medical doctors, never once talked to myself, never once asked the kids or believed the kids. Um, 
and off to the races we went. So my ex-husband was allowed to abuse the children in these reunification therapy sessions, which I now know I was a victim of uh, an experimental reunification process, which is called parental alienation syndrome. And I have the complete outline of what happened or what the process is. And it is from the American Journal of Family Medicine. Um, it's an outline from Richard Gardner, which in his own, own writing, in his own procedures, this is what happens to you. Um, and it states, this is the program I was under, the court-sanctioned program. And it says, such therapists must know exactly what threats they can use to lend support to their suggestions, instructions, and even manipulations. I have no hesitation using the words threats. Life is filled with threats. It says, it is in the treatment of parental alienation syndrome families that threats are crucial. Empty threats are not only a waste of time, but also compromise the treatment. Threats that have little, if any, possibility of implementation provide the therapist with the reputation of being weak and impotent and significantly compromise the likelihood that the treatment will be effective. I was also put under the, set, the court sanction, this is uh, the higher level of threat. The higher level threat might involve a court order reduction in payments. The alienated parent is required to provide the alienator. Of course, there are limitations to the threat um, in that you cannot leave the programming parent des destitute. Um, he was making $150,000, I was making $20,000. Um, Perry Raffinelli said if he can't see the kids then he shouldn't be able to, he shouldn't have to pay any child support. And then it says here, and they threatened me with this, and at the very end I knew that this was going to, or that's, then I found out the end result if, um, uh, he was going to take my children away from me and give them to my ex-husband because it, he wrote it right in the report at the end. He said um, that if we will never know what would have happened if the husband had custody of these children. And it was right, right in the end of one of Mr. Kosloff's report. And this is after uh, Chrissy had to be institutionalized, uh, traumatized so much in these threat court-ordered sanction reunification therapy, um, he blocked the door and, um, and Chrissy was screaming to get out. She screamed almost 40 times to get out and he blocked the door and that's when Chrissy had a, um, they're called complex post-traumatic stress. Um, it's just like trauma where her brain didn't work anymore. She came home from that visit and um, she said, Ma, I don't want to live anymore. She said, my head hurts and I can't think. And at that point, I had a gag order and I couldn't call anybody and I couldn't do anything. So I have friends in upstate New York, which is very peaceful up there. It's the woods. So I put her in the car and I told my son, I put my son with friends and I said, I have to take Chrissy and go. So I went up there and on the way up Mass Pike, Chrissy had this blank stare and just stared forward. She didn't move her head left or right. Meg Murdy, her pediatrician that advocated her to beg these people to stop doing this, that wrote letters upon letters to the judge. And Peter Kossoff would never, ever, ever call her or talk to her. Well, now I know that was illegal because you're supposed to coordinate care with a primary care physician with any mental health therapy. Um, the doctor told me to, I got up to New York and she was no better. She was just a blank death stare, couldn't remember anything. What happened five minutes prior to that? The medical doctor told me to get her back down here and have her um, go to Hasbro Children's Hospital where she uh, couldn't remember anything. Um, she was institutionalized there for almost two weeks. She was having audio and visual hallucinations of her father killing her. 
Um, she was put on Seroquel, which is an antipsychotic psychotic medication. She was put on liquid volume because she could swallow pills because he used to shove pills down her throat and make her go to sleep so he could molest her. Um, and uh, what I was... Instead of being the father convicted of sexual assault on his kids and his wife, which was later written in a major crime squad report, um, I was being prosecuted for parental alienation by Mr. Kerry Raffinelli and Peter Kossoff. And I, my daughter now is disabled. I am disabled. And my son, David Johnson, is disabled. We are not disabled before this. Now we are. We have to have American disability accommodations because we can't concentrate. My daughter has to have disability services in school, um, a high level of care. It's cost Blue Cross Blue Shield almost $70,000 just for Chrissy alone. And it costs the state, the taxpayer money, um, for the disability services that they service us. And again, um, the courts have to listen to the police. The Major Crime Squad of Connecticut contacted me about something, and they had to come down and talk to me. And uh, in talking to them about that situation, I told them what was going on here because they knew David Johnson because he was from Connecticut. And David Johnson, my ex-husband, was on probation for exposing himself and on probation for two years for doing it. Um, I just want the states to work together with the police. They, I brought the Major Crime Squad police report down here to Rhode Island. I took it to the North Kingstown Police Department because Chrissy was sexually assaulted in North Kingstown at the um, air show. The North Kingstown Police Department told me that the Major Crime Squad of Connecticut, after interviewing my whole um, divorce file, medical records, psychological records on all of us, um, they said uh, they didn't have jurisdiction, and Brian Narkowitz, a Major Crime Squad detective, said, please have him call me, and I did. I asked him to call, and they didn't call. The North Kingstown Police Department, um, I didn't stop there. I went to the assistant district attorney. His name's Mr. R I'm sorry. His name was... Stephen A. Regine, Assistant Attorney General, Chief, Washington County in Wakefield, Rhode Island. And he said after he spoke with Chrissy, he can't prosecute because uh, Chrissy wasn't penetrated. The North Kingston Police I talked to was Stephen D. St. Ange, Detective L Lieutenant, a Joel P. Mulligan, a detective at North Kingstown Police Department. I also went over to the Major Crime Squad over in Situate with a Major Crime Squad report from Connecticut, and they said that sounds really weird, so they called North Kingstown, and then North Kingstown went down with me to the assistant DA. Um, I filed a complaint with Alinda Julian. Um, she's with the State of Rhode Island Department of Health. Um, the Major Crime Squad sent called me and said that the investigation's over. And I said, what investigation? You didn't even talk to Chrissy or I or my son. And they said, the investigation's closed. Or they will have no more conversation with me. And I kept going and kept going. And um, I just don't, I will never for the life of me understand why um, the Major Crime Squad of Connecticut can do a forensic report. They only interview kids that have been sexually assaulted or they interview mur uh, they investigate murders. Um, I would like for anybody listening to this 
my case is now in superior court. Um, no one in the state will represent me because it's too politically connected. My attorney at the time was Karen Lynch Bernard, and I didn't know it at the time, but she was going for family court judge. She dropped me um, after I had turned Peter Kossoff into the medical board for his um, fraudulent uh, experimental therapy. He was billing Blue Cross Blue Shield for this therapy. Um, I'm a medical coder and biller, and I know for a fact that parental alienation syndrome is not a diagnosis code, and that's what he was doing in his office, and he was getting paid by the commercial insurance companies, and under both policies that my kids and I were under, United Healthcare and also Blue Cross Blue Shield, court-ordered custody evaluations, visits are not covered I'm under both of those mental health plans. They're not even not covered, but parental alienation is not a diagnosis code that you can bill for. So what he was doing was he took my son and he diagnosed him with anxiety, but he was doing a procedure in the office as parental alienation syndrome, and that's how he was getting paid by United Health and also Blue Cross Blue Shield. Um, so he was fraudulently billing both uh, insurance companies and anybody that is practicing parental alienation and billing any commercial insurance is fraud. They're doing it a different way by diagnosing another member of the family with something else and then doing something else in the office and billing it. Um, the procedure is the most horrific, threatening procedure I've ever seen in my life. Um, Richard Gardner also states in here it's almost like a debriefing and a hostage. Um, but this has to stop. The damages are irreparable. We lost six years of our life um, that we can never get back. Once I entered the family court, I was looking for justice. I wasn't, I, I wasn't looking for more abuse. And I was not looking to be, have people profit off of uh, the crimes that were committed against us. And that's just what they did. They profited off of somebody else's um, abuse. No one was there while Chrissy was hallucinating. No one said they were sorry. And no one wanted to hear that I had um, the kids interviewed by the major crime squad. Um, this man has to be stopped. Right now, he is a registered nurse in the state of Connecticut. And uh, he works... He's a registered nurse. His license number is seven seven zero two three. The expiration is January 31st, 2013. He was granted the license in the state of Connecticut. October 25th, 2005. The license name is David B. Johnson. He's active. And he works for the de de develop, developmentally ill um, psychiatric facility in Torrington, Connecticut. Um, He's dangerous. Brian Narquist, the detective, said he's very highly dangerous. Um, he's a psych psychopath. And um, he has to be stopped. He is a sex offender and a rapist. And I just can't even imagine what the people in that facility are going through. Because they don't, they're mentally um, incapable of speaking on their own behalf. His, uh, I found out that he did the same thing to his ex-wife. I didn't even know he had highly supervised with his first daughter. And um, 
she owns a riding stable in Litchfield, Connecticut. And at the time when they were married, the girl by the name of Charlene worked at the stables and he used to rape her, take her to school and rape her at the building where he owned and then take her across the street and drop her off at school from the age of 14 to 17 until she could get away and she's in Vermont now because I've contacted her. But um, I just, uh, he's the most sadistic person and to have a lawyer and judges um, support him and not families, women and children is such a high crime. I, I just, I don't even feel like I, I live in the U.S. My rights have been taken away from me and justice has not been served. I am now uh, a pro se disabled litigant in Superior Court in Providence, Rhode Island. Like I said before, nobody will take my case because it's too politically connected. And um, after submitting my briefs, I was called um, against Mr. Kerry Raffinelli and Peter Kossoff. I was called in front of the um, practicing law without a license, the UPL committee of the state of Rhode Island. There I sat in front of 14 members of the committee and they wanted to know who wrote my briefs and I told them I did. And they said I couldn't possibly write them. But Carrie Raffinelli wants to have me sanctioned for suing him in superior court and blaming me because I did not write my own um, briefs. I don't know where that stands now. Um, all I can say is today um, I wrote those briefs. Everything is a tr in, in there is a tr the truth and I just don't think that they can stand the fact that they're being exposed and they're going to continue to hold my case in the state of Rhode Island so it does not get out because I'm a big uh, dirty secret that they want to keep secret here in Rhode Island and anytime I stepped out of Rhode Island I had to take the kids across the border to Connecticut because I didn't want my kids to speak to anybody and just to have them stabilized and pay cash for it. Now I don't think any human being should have to do that to take their kids and pay cash just to have them talk to somebody. Um, I just need help with my superior. They need to be held accountable. These men need to be these judges and uh, GALs need to be held accountable. They need to be arrested and punished for what they did. They perjured themselves. They hid evidence. They didn't, they hid medical reports. Um, Peter Kossoff laughed at me and said, so when's the trial when I handed him? Um, a police report on the side of me of me and threw it back at me um, and just he perjured himself. He knew, he knew all along this happened and he still forced my kids which made my kids so sick. But, and I just don't want this to happen to anybody else and it is happening on a daily basis. I have to drive by Peter Kossoff's office. I try and avoid it but it's in the center of Wakefield. And I see people and kids going in and out. I've had to go into the family court to get records and I've heard his name. He's the best. He's the only one that does it and because he's the only one that does it, he's the only one that in the state of Rhode Island that will put his license on the line to make money. Um, I just beg, beg Congress to please hold these people responsible. They're hurting other families and kids. Um, I know other therapists because I'm in the medical industry. Other therapists have said they have other mothers that they're treating that have gone through this parental alienation syndrome deprogramming and most of the women lost their kids. I don't know why I was so fortunate to keep mine. Everybody says I'm fortunate but they're very sick kids. And the ones that are, don't get out. I can't even imagine what they're going through.
I can't do this anymore. <laughs> Watch the cut. 